All right, so I want to take a brief period of time to talk about a couple of issues related to safety. Uh, excuse me for one second. I just want to see how this is laid out. Okay. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but on the other hand, I would kind of be remiss if I didn't address it at all. And also, it'll be an opportunity within reason <laughs> any questions that people have related to any safety issues either now or later on uh, you know I'll feel feel free we could we could discuss those but what I want to do is give you not so much a kind of a detailed point by point you know this device is okay or that device is not but I just want to conceptually address a couple of issues and I find that um, you know especially for the you know for the radiologists so someday you're going to be the physician in charge and a lot, of the, a lot of the phone calls that I get, and I do get lots of phone calls all the time, which is totally fine. People should feel free to call me. Uh, the questions that, that are often asked uh, generally fall into two categories. One is there are things that are clearly spelled out in the written safety policy. And the other is they are things that may not be, but you know, if people would sort of have more of a big picture kind of conceptual understanding of what's involved, you can sort of reason your way through. Now, I don't mean to say that you guys should be taking on that responsibility necessarily, and not that you would necessarily want to, but you know, someday you may be in that position. And there is a kind of a science, maybe it's partially an art, to how to deal with these questions. And so I just wanted to outline what some of the issues are and make people aware of things that they may or may not be familiar with. So, and we'll keep this informal, so if you have, you know, questions as we go along, feel free. So when we talk about, right, safety issues with MR, and I'm not going to talk about contrast agents today, the whole NSF thing, that's kind of out of the scope. If, if any of you want to talk about that, we could talk about it another time. But we're basically talking about things that are related to different components of the MR system the B0 magnetic field, the RF system, and the gradients. And each of these has a unique safety issue that we need to deal with. So the one that is or should be most obvious is the static magnetic field. Right? We all know that if you bring something ferromagnetic into the strong static magnetic field that it will be drawn toward the magnet and we have this potential for a missile effect which we know can kill people right it was in I mean there's a tremendous awareness now of MR safety which I think in a large part it dates back to 2001 there was a famous incident at uh, Westchester County Medical Center does everyone remember this anyone remember this it was a little boy who was in the scanner and someone brought the oxygen tank in the room and he basically, I mean, the gory story is, even though this wasn't discussed in the news, is that basically his head, which he had been operated on for, to have a curative resection for a brain tumor, was crushed by this oxygen tank. So it's, a, it's really, it's a huge responsibility when you work around these magnetic fields. So unfortunately, people don't pay nearly enough attention to this. And it's very common, especially people that don't have a lot of knowledge, that I find very often that someone will come around and say, well, it's, you know, it's okay to bring this in the room, or they don't really think to empty out their pockets, or you know, whether it's a clipboard or a pen or a pair of scissors, which we once had a child's head lacerated by a pair of scissors that someone left in their lab coat pocket. Okay, we'll talk about that. That's a good question. All right. And it's very easy, right? <laughs> it's very easy, go to the gym. <laughs> it's very easy to, especially in the kind of, you know, hectic hustle and bustle of a busy clinical situation, to lose track of this. Uh, you know, one situation which I can just give you as an example is that when you have a lot of patients around, as once happened at a, recently at another institution, 
there was a whole bunch of patients around. They were kind of short-staffed. And the patient got brought into the scanner room on the wrong stretcher. Right? The one that was from the floor, you know, steel. <laughs> and that patient, who ended up being fine, but had the ride of their life because <laughs> <laughs> over a very short distance, right? I mean, it, I mean, we're talking about a distance that's like between me and the wall over there. There is just a tremendous force. And as you, the way the magnets are designed, something that is important to be aware of is, you know, we've been drawing all week this cartoon <laughs> of what the bore of the scanner looks like. So one of the things that you hopefully are aware of is that we have a static magnetic field and that the magnetic field strength falls off with distance. And if this were simply really as we've described it, just a bunch of coils of superconducting wire with current flowing through them, there would be a continuous gradual fall off of that magnetic field strength. Right? That would extend very far. Right? Now there is an issue of the safety of certain types of medical devices right, within a magnetic field strength that exceeds five gauss. And we'll talk about that in a minute. This is the, one of the pacemaker safety issues. So there is a safety issue when you plan the site where you're going to place an MR scanner that you need to cordon off any place where there is a magnetic field that exceeds five gauss. The problem is that a typical 1.5 or certainly a 3T MR scanner, by itself, its field would extend very far away. In the old days, when they first started to install MR scanners, they would be in these separate buildings, which would have fences around the outside with signs saying, you know, strong magnetic field, do not cross. So that becomes a very difficult problem, especially in places where they're short on space. So the manufacturers developed, well I wouldn't say they developed, but they implemented and started to sell systems that have what we call active shielding. And active shielding is essentially extra magnetic fields on the outside of the magnet which are oriented in the opposite direction of the static magnetic field. So they essentially cancel or truncate that magnetic field. And that's great because it now means that we could install a 3T MRI scanner in a room about the size of the one we're in right now, even shorter. Right? The problem that you need to be aware of is that as opposed to this gradual decline in the magnetic field in the absence of shielding, these actively shielded magnets have a magnetic field that drops to zero very rapidly, which means you can actually get remarkably close to them holding, I don't know, a tire iron in your hand and not feel like it's pulling on you at all. You could get within a few feet. But once you start to get a little bit closer, there is, the, if we look at over some distance, right, if this is the location where the actual bore of the magnet begins, right, here's our scanner. And if we look at magnetic field strength over this distance, we'll see that it will be very low, and then all of a sudden it will shoot up extremely high. The slope of this gradient of magnetic field strength is extremely steep, which means that when you start to approach the scanner, you can very rapidly be overwhelmed by the force. So in this example of the stretcher, that's exactly what happened person was able to go into the room, more than a yard into the room, without anything happening. But as soon as you cross that threshold, it grabs the object. Right? Unfortunately, in this case, no one was hurt, and the equipment wasn't damaged either. The question is, how do you get it out? So you try now to pull that out, forget yeah, right. it. Not <laughs> happening. Even Smitha is not going to get that out. <laughs> Look at these guys. Okay. So, the, the, <laughs> so there, there are a couple of approaches to removing an object like that. One is to actually anchor a winch outside of the room 
and somehow attach a cable to the object and crank. And once it gets far enough away from the scanner, it will literally just drop on the floor. You have to be extreme. You can kill yourself. I mean, you can do serious damage because remember that this is a strong magnetic field. Okay? If we just think about our two little bar magnets that we talked about on Monday, when we bring them together, we know that they will tend to align with each other. Opposite poles. Okay? When we take a ferromagnetic object and place it near a magnet, you know, let's say we have a paper clip on the table and I put a magnet down. Once I get close enough, you'll notice that it will align very rapidly in a specific orientation with that magnet. Well, what happens then is let's say we have an object. Let's say an oxygen tank is a good example. It's a long, relatively right, linear object. And let's say it is attached to the outside of this magnetic field. And let's say it has some kind of a handle. We can grab it and try and pull it out, either you know, with our hands or attach some kind of winch to it. As soon, right now, when it's up against the bore, it's held very tightly against the machine in whatever orientation it happened to land. As soon as you start to take it away from its contact with that surface, it will tend to align with the magnetic field which means that it will torque into that alignment with tremendous force. So removing something like this can be extremely dangerous. Now I'll tell you a story of a former colleague of mine who was about six foot six and a very massive, I mean strong person, an engineer, who was installing in an MRI scanner, not nowhere around here, a an LCD video projector. This goes back around five, seven years or so. And it was to do functional MRI experiments. So this projector was not an MRI safe device. And the person who was w very experienced in working around high magnetic fields knew this, was bringing it in the room to place it on a table far away from the scanner. So whatever happened, it got too close and went flying up against the scanner. And we then had this, and this was the old days when they weren't so compact, this large LCD projector anchored up against the scanner. So this big strong person decided that they were going to remove it. Went up and grabbed the object and was strong enough to pull it away wow. from the surface of the magnet. But as soon as, and they should have known better, because as soon as they got it away, it instantly started to torque, and this happens very rapidly, and torqued around so that this person's elbow was now between this object and the scanner, right? And several surgeries later, right, they still weren't the same as far as the elbow was concerned. So this is a really important point which I wanted to bring up, which is if you ever end up in a situation where you have an object like this against the scanner, this is a John, this is one of these don't try it yourself things, right? <laughs> and there are service people who are trained to remove these objects, and typically the way to do so is to bring down the magnetic field. How much does that cost? And how, why does it cost? Why does it cost? Yeah, all, that, all that electricity that it took. Okay, turn it off electricity. You can turn it back on again. So <laughs> you're still using that electricity anyway. You're saying, on. what's the big deal? Why does it cost so much money? Right. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. I'm sure it's a very simple Why answer. It so long? it's basically an expensive proposition because the people who do it charge a lot of money to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it involves some specialized equipment and some people with specialized training, and it's a solid, full day's worth of work. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about hiring two people with very specialized training and specialized equipment, taking a lot of responsibility that they don't damage this $3 million machine while they do it, they charge a lot of money to do it. Uh, why, why isn't it cheap? I mean, maybe our President Obama is going to resolve the cost of <laughs> magnet ramping. <laughs> I, I don't know. What school did it go to? Maybe we should change <laughs> our education, <laughs> I mean, our yeah. line of work. Okay. Then you have to be able to teach this.
So, <laughs> so the first, so the first message is, just be very cognizant of the fact that this is a, this is a hugely powerful force. And I just want to show you two examples to give you a sense of what this is about. So, I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to show you the watermelon. <coughs> Sorry. Oxygen tank. Oxygen, oxygen tank and a watermelon. Like in our oh. <coughs> okay. So this one is famous, right? This is the janitor that comes in to buff the floor. Okay. <coughs> Everyone has seen one of these, I'm sure, on the internet. Okay. This is a video clip which was given to me by some people at General Electric. This is a demo that they did a long time ago. I don't know if you may have, I don't know if you've ever seen the whole video. It's kind of very sort of uh, funny narrative to this videotape. But what they've done is this is taking place in the factory. And they have a 1.5 Tesla MR scanner set up right, right over here. Here's the bore of the scanner. Let, let me do it in the same orientation as the video is going to occur. This is a close-up, so I just want to give you some perspective so you understand what's going on. The bore of the scanner is over here. And they took a sheet of plywood and covered it up so it wouldn't be damaged. And <coughs> stacked some bricks up in front of the bore of the magnet. Then there is a technician over here who is going to take a pipe wrench. You know what a pipe wrench is? Suffice it to say, it's a big piece of steel. And he's standing a good six, seven feet away. And he's going to hold his hand out, and he'll start to feel sort of a tug on that wrench, and we'll just let it go. And what you're going to watch is that wrench as it sails toward the, toward the magnet. Is this on YouTube? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, this is a proprietary video, so I don't know. So that's the hand. Right. That was that guy's elbow. Yeah. And at 3T, this would be right ever stronger. So this is a kind of a slow motion close-up. So the acceleration, sure. So the acceleration of this wrench, <coughs> you know, is uh, actually I think in the video they clock it. It's in the range of like you know 70 miles an hour by the time that it hits the. Boom. Okay. So, you know, we can laugh about it, but if that's a patient. <laughs> It's a big problem, right? Okay. So that's basically what I wanted to say about the static magnetic field. Be careful, okay? Now, one word about something that I know is commonly a clinical issue is people <coughs> always ask about implanted devices. The patient has an IVC filter, they have a bullet fragment, they have a whatever they happen to have. So assuming we're not talking about anything that has any electronics in it, which is a, a separate issue, just as a rule of thumb, there are a few criteria that if you keep in mind, you can keep this straight. First of all, the first question you always want to ask is, does the manufacturer have anything to say about this? Right. Most of the devices that we're talking about that are being implanted today I wouldn't say all of them, but most of them, you will find that the manufacturer has information on a website or available by phone or in the package insert or wherever it happens to be about the MR compatibility of the device. And most of these static type of devices that are being used today, uh, most of what we encounter are MR safe. If it's made out of a metal like titanium or platinum or gold or whatever it happens to be, that is non-ferromagnetic, this is completely, this aspect of the safety question is not an issue. So if the patient has a nitinol vena cava filter placed in the next 20 minutes, they can go immediately from the angio suite where that filter is placed into the MR scanner. There's no safety issue whatsoever. Right? If they're in the operating room today and they have a valve replacement, and that valve, when you go and you look at the St. Jude website or whatever it is, they say this is safe until three Tesla, then there's no reason why you have to be concerned about placing that patient in the scanner. So that's first off, is just determine whether the device is an issue at all. Yeah? 
not if it's it depends on it depends on the device if the manufacturer says that this device is MRI safe or compatible at this field strength then there isn't so if that valve for example is made out of all titanium components it's not a safety issue I'm, I'm going to address what you're getting at in just a second okay so that's first off just determine whether or not it's an MR safe device now there are some situations at the other extreme such as a patient with an aneurysm clip that you either have no idea what it's made out of what type of clip it is or certainly if you know that it's an older potentially ferromagnetic clip there's no way you're ever going to image such a patient if you have someone who you know has metal fragments in their eye that's someone who we're never going to be imaging now what happens if we have a device that is somewhere in between so just as an example there are heart valves which are certified as what are called MR conditional and in general the classification of these devices uh, is as follows this is still a little bit you know in flux but generally we talk about devices as being either MR safe MR conditional or unsafe right? there's another category that you may hear used which is MR compatible okay. the first three are talking about safety aspects of that device the last category MR compatible has to do with something in addition to safety which I'll get to in a minute so there are devices which are MR safe which means basically under any circumstances this is typically tagged to is always tagged to a specific field strength these are safe so Foley catheters for example that are only made out of silicone or whatever are always going to be MR safe uh, certain titanium aneurysm clips are MR safe the patient can have the surgery this morning and with that clip can go into the MR tonight there's no reason there's nothing gained by waiting because there is none of this issue of an interaction of the device with the static magnetic field and unsafe is obviously unsafe MR conditional is where we get into a more of a gray zone and this for example would be some types of heart valves uh, some types of IVC filters like the bird's nest filter which might get used once in a while so these are typically these are devices that have some potentially or partially ferromagnetic components however the assessment involves not just whether in vitro there's any attraction of this device to a magnetic field it also has to do with the intended biologic use of the device meaning that if we have a heart valve that has some slightly ferromagnetic components and the surgeon goes in and sews it into the heart and it becomes you know bio-integrated with tissue so right there in the operating room when they start the heart up again this valve is under tremendous amount of stress just from the beating of the heart and in most of these cases with the heart valves the determination is based on the in vitro assessment of the interaction of the device with a magnetic field that the stress on that device from the simple intended use which is beating the heart the beating of the heart is much less than what would ever be exerted by the magnetic field so uh, and a, sim a similar example is the bird's nest filter yes it has some slightly ferromagnetic components but when you place it it's embedded into the walls of the IVC and certainly over time with scar tissue and endothelial proliferation etc it becomes bio-integrated with the IVC so the feeling is and you know the whatever limited data exists tells us that these devices in their intended use are safe 
For MR conditional devices, there is still uncertainty as to what does that mean. Does that mean you can implant this device now and you can image it right away? Or does it mean that you should wait for this device after its implantation to become as fully integrated as it is going to need to be? So this is where we get to this issue of a waiting period. And you know, people have promoted different approaches, wait two weeks, wait six weeks. Uh, it's a, to be honest with you, it's a little bit of hocus pocus. I don't think anyone really knows a, definitively whether it makes a difference, whether you wait at all or how long you wait. So you know, we generally try to t take a conservative approach and make an assessment as to how badly the exam needs to be done. In most cases, as you all know, the indications for the study are pretty weak. If that's the case, we would much rather put it off and let the patient wait, you know, be conservative six weeks. Uh, you might not want to be the one at this point making these decisions, but you know, confronted with a scenario where there really was a pressing need for a study to be done, we might do these much sooner. Okay? So that issue of a waiting time, though, does not pertain if you're talking about a device that is MR safe. Larry? Uh, just so the, the risk to the patient from these devices is from the device moving, not from generating some electric current or some heat that's going to burn yeah. the patient. I'm going to talk about that separately. Okay. That's okay. a separate issue, and we're not talking about that at all. So we're talking about moving We're talking devices. about dislodging the device. Okay. Absolutely. I'm sorry okay. if I wasn't clear about that. That's all we're talking about right now. Okay. And the other concerns you have, by the way, would be no different immediately after you implant it or down the road. Right. And those are potential issues which we'll talk about. Okay. So that's really what I wanted to get across about the static magnetic field is that it's a major hazard that you have to be very careful about. And just to lay out this issue now, the MR compatible classification has to do not so much with the safety of the device, but the extent to which the device might interfere with the diagnostic quality of the images that we generate. Okay? So for, for a device to truly be MR compatible, it means it can't create significant artifacts. There are not all that many implants that are truly MR compatible in that sense. Which is a bit of a problem, but that's a whole other story. The last thing related to the uh, static magnetic field, or potentially related at least in part to the static magnetic field, is uh, electronic devices, things like pacemakers, defibrillators, spinal cord stimulators, cochlear implants. Okay, these devices uh, we exclude from any area with a magnetic field strength greater than 5 gauss because of potential damage to the device. Now obviously someone with a cochlear implant whose device is destroyed by the magnetic field is not going to die, but it's kind of a big deal to have that uh, happen to something that they've gone through you know, surgery to implant to replace their hearing. Patients with pacemakers on the, under, on the other hand, right, that's, a, that's a major hazard. Uh, there are various reasons why pacemakers may be problematic in MR. Uh, the way we operate is that we don't image anyone with any pacemaker for any reason whatsoever. Uh, actually, several years ago, on the corner of Morris Park, you know where you go into Jacoby in the back over here, there was an MRI center. I think it's closed down now on the corner. So I know when I was a resident here, there was a patient. They were not affiliated with us came for an MR scan and came out of the scanner dead. And that was a pacemaker. So this issue of pacemakers in MR is something that is surprisingly, I don't know if it's little known or recognized or just people don't care, they don't pay attention, but I would think that you know most doctors have some idea that there's a safety issue related to pacemakers in MRI. And we routinely have people sending patients with pacemakers for MR scans. So text the nurses, do they check? Because sometimes they they say, check the all the time. They look in packs at their old x-rays. They physically examine patients, even when the patient is alert and able to give you a history. And they pick them up. They have patients who say, you know, have you ever had any surgery, had a pacemaker put in? No. And there it is. <laughs> 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 
I mean, our techs, our techs are really good at, they pick these up all the time. There's a, you know, a handful every month that they pick up where there was no suggestion on the referral that the doctor had any idea. Can't they like turn off the pacemaker beforehand? Uh, okay, so <laughs> that would de <laughs> that would depend first of all on whether the patient can live without the pacemaker for the duration of the exam. However, okay. However, perhaps uh, we're actually we're kind of transitioning into some of these other areas. So let, let's address those first and remind me if I don't, we'll come back to your question. So let's just to, to move along. So the next issue that I wanted to talk about is the RF system. So this is a time varying magnetic field. It's our rotating magnetic field, rotating at the Larmor frequency, 65 <laughs> megahertz of one, one and a half Tesla. And one of the things that we mentioned earlier is that RF is basically depositing energy in the patient. That's how we create the rotation of the magnet of the signal in the patient. That's how we generate signal. The more RF we have, the more power we are depositing in the patient. And there is a way to measure the power deposition called the specific absorption rate. And the reason why this is a concern is because by depositing energy in your patient, you are basically heating them up. Right? When a patient goes in for an MR scan, depending on how you do the scan, if you use a lot of fast spin echo pulse sequences, which use long trains of 180 degree RF pulses, which are twice the power deposition as the 90 degree RF pulse, the patient comes out of the scanner, they're actually warm. I don't know, has anyone ever here, anyone ever been in the scanner? It's like an experience. I mean, you really, it heats, it really does heat you up. So there are guidelines that the FDA has in place for how much power it's reasonable to deposit in your patient over a period of time. And these are measured in terms of the specific absorption rate. And the scanners actually all operate with systems which monitor the power deposition. So when you sit down to set up a pulse sequence and you start specifying parameters, let's say your echo train, how many 180 degree RF pulses you're going to apply. The scanner is computing based on the weight of the patient and what it knows about the pulse sequence. It is computing what the specific absorption rate will be for this specific pulse sequence. And if it exceeds those FDA guidelines, it won't let you proceed. So there are all kinds of safeties that are built into the system to make sure that we don't cook the patient. Okay. Now it's interesting that if you look at the wavelength of the radiation, right, the energy that we're applying to this patient, the RF energy, that its wavelength relative to the body part, to the human subject that is in there, is relatively large as opposed to, as an example, the wavelength of the energy applied by your microwave oven to a potato or whatever you happen to put in there. So we know that when you cook in a microwave, right, when you forget to make the holes in the outside of the potato, what happens? It explodes, why? Because it's being heated from the inside out. Right? Actually, the opposite is true in MR. That people tend to be heated on the surface right, before they're heated in the depths of the tissue. Which in and of itself is actually a safety feature, so to speak, because the patient feels it. Right? I mean, the babies, I guess we shouldn't even talk about that, that get put in the microwave and get cooked from the inside out. <laughs> You know, these, there have been these horrible uh, cases recently. Like of, bad baby. Yeah. So. Yeah, usually happens in Florida. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we do. Okay. It's been a long day. So. Twilight. <laughs> so. <laughs> 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 
liquor babies raw. <laughs> 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 okay. So the patient, the patient actually feels this warmth superficially. But the, the point I want to get across is not so much this basic issue of tissue heating. Because if this is all it was, if it was just a matter of not using too much RF t and not overcooking the patient, we once made a joke that, you know, there should be like a little dialogue that comes up that, you know, you'd like the subject either at rare, <laughs> medium, or well done. But the scanners do actually a very good job of monitoring power deposition and making sure that we don't overdo it. What you need to be aware of, right, since you're not actually writing pulse sequences, most of you guys are not designing these types of acquisitions, as a user, what you need to be aware of is that this applies to the heating of tissue. And factored into the calculation of the specific absorption rate is understanding how the RF energy is absorbed by the tissue. There are other things that much more efficiently absorb this RF energy, such as metal. Right? So as an example, when we talk about this, you know, the patient has an MRI safe aneurysm clip implanted this morning. We know it's a titanium clip, it's 100% safe. We have a letter from the manufacturer, everything is okay. So you take the patient from the operating room, they're having some complication, and we place them in the scanner tonight to do an MR scan of the brain. And the patient comes out and, right, right along the line where their incision is stapled together, they have a series of third degree burns. Okay, why? Because the skin staples, which are metal, even though they're also titanium, they're not ferromagnetic, but they are conductors. Right? And they're virtually looped conductors, by the way. <coughs> Tissue is conductive itself. So even though the scanner figured out how much energy was reasonable to deposit in this person's head and not overdo it, it doesn't account for the fact that there was something there which was much more efficient at absorbing that RF energy. And there can be tremendous heating of these types of objects. This could be every, anything from skin staples to orthopedic hardware, right? Whether it's a hip replacement, to jewelry, right, body piercings that don't come off or that people don't want to take off. Are, it's a very, I mean, we laugh about it, but it's, and I can tell you very interesting stories, but it's a, <laughs> ver, it's a very serious, it's a very serious safety issue, especially when you have a looped conductor. So an earring, for example, or some other ring that's a complete loop is a very efficient conductor of this energy. Okay. The same thing is true, right, of tattoos. What can you do for aneurysm? I mean, you can't put a heat sink on an aneurysm clip. Okay. So with the aneurysm clip per se, so if that's if that's your concern, let's say the patient's already finished, their staples are out, and we don't have to worry about that. So we have an advantage. First of all, it's deep within the tissue. And as we've said, heating is going to be much more of a problem at the surface. Okay? So for example, patients with a hip prosthesis or a, you know, one of those compression plates on the lateral surface of the femur, even though it's titanium, it's not ferromagnetic, they can feel that those become warm during the scan. But things that are much deeper within tissue are actually less likely, right? to heat significantly. The other thing is that the location of whatever the object is may provide an opportunity for heat to dissipate. Uh, also the mass of the, you know, the amount of metal you have may provide an opportunity for heat to dissipate. So as an example, intravascular stents, even though they are made out of some, you know, super metal that's non-ferromagnetic and most of the stents are 
I mean, I wouldn't say all of them, but most of the stents that are on the market today are generally not ferromagnetic. Because they're intravascular and there is constant flow of blood through the lumen of the stent, that's basically a heat, heat sink in and of itself. The CSF flowing around that aneurysm clip, in a sense, is a mechanism for dissipating heat. So I don't want to go into this in excruciating detail. The bottom line is, whenever you have metal on a patient, right, tattoos, jewelry, skin staples, orthopedic hardware, all these things that may not be ferromagnetic, permanent makeup is an issue. Uh, you first of all have to be aware of it. And secondly, you have to take whatever precautions you can take. And it's really, it's a risk assessment. If it's a patient that has a, you know, some non-removable hoop of jewelry, for example, uh, I would be very hesitant to, to scan the patient because those are, are very efficient conductors. If it's an issue with skin staples, again, is it possible to delay this until we can get them out of there? If you have a situation where you're trying to make a risk-benefit assessment in someone who really needs to have this study now and can't wait for us to resolve the issue, or let's say it's a tattoo, you're not going to, I mean, what are you going to do? It's, it's there. So one of the approaches that can be taken, well, the first thing that you always have to do is make the patient aware of the situation because they're really your best guide. It's not, you're not going to put them in there and they are going to instantaneously have the full thickness of their skin burned away as soon as the scanner turns on. They're going to start to feel something first. So if you explain to them what is happening, and this is provided the patient is able to communicate, that's another consideration, then you need to constantly be in communication with that patient and make sure that during the scan they are, you're cross-checking with them and making sure that they're not having discomfort that might mean that something adverse is going on. The other thing is that there are things that we can use, as Lindsay said, as a heat sink. You can take an ice pack or a towel soaked in cold water, wrung out, and laid across these types of superficial metallic areas, which actually are very efficient at, di at dissipating any heating. And again, being, you know, being in contact with the patient. Okay, the last piece that I wanted to talk about is the gradient magnetic fields. Now, gradient magnetic fields, in a sense, are conceptually very similar to the RF field. They're both electromagnets that vary over time. The difference is that the amplitude at which we're applying the gradient magnetic field is less, and the duration is much less. So the total amount of power that is being deposited by these gradient magnetic fields is generally not directly an issue in terms of tissue heating. Nonetheless, if you do have metallic conductive material, right, you could certainly cause right, heating in something that very efficiently absorbs this energy. But the issue with gradient magnetic fields is due to very rapid switching of the gradient magnetic fields over time that these are actually able to induce current voltage in conductive material. So for example, one of the things that, are, and this becomes more of a problem at higher magnetic field strength. One of the issues, for example, at 3T, when we do something like echoplanar imaging, where we're switching our gradients extremely rapidly, is that you can directly stimulate peripheral nerves with the gradient magnetic fields. So the patient will be lying in the scanner and they feel twitching. Or they feel sort of like electric shocks running up and down their skin. Uh, this is something that people are aware of. Uh, it's interesting that the FDA actually doesn't seem to really consider this to be a major problem. These are transient effects that are gone once the patient is out of the scanner. And the threshold for these effects in terms of when they say you have to stop imaging is the patient telling you that it's too painful for them to keep going, believe it or not. So if you have a tough patient, you're in business. But what I wanted to talk about more than the, this idea of peripheral nerve stimulation, which 
it's almost like more of a, a comfort or a curiosity issue than really a true safety issue, is what happens if you have some type of conductive material? So we talked about how pacemakers are problematic. And a pacemaker we know is composed of a piece of electronics that generates electrical impulses and a wire or multiple wires that go from that device usually implanted in the chest wall into the heart. So two things. First of all, the gradient magnetic fields may interact with the pulse generator, with the electronics, okay, and cause it to function abnormally. But secondly, those gradient magnetic fields can actually interact directly with the electrode. So for example, there have been experiments in dogs. I didn't do these, okay? But in dogs that had pacemakers implanted, the heart was able to be paced by the gradient magnetic fields. So the switching of the gradient magnetic field was inducing a voltage in this conductor that was causing enough of an impulse to pace the cardiac cycle. So let's say we have a patient, for example, that had a pacemaker implanted years and years ago, and now they underwent some, you know, electrophysiology procedure where they did an ablation and they don't need their pacemaker anymore. So typically what they will do, I mean, not that this is my area of expertise, but my understanding is they'll remove the pulse generator, but commonly the Electro, the lead is not taken out because it's embedded in the endocardium and it's, you can't just yank it out, it might be a problem. So this person now has this conductive object which is attached to their heart. They're not dependent on any kind of pacemaker at all. If we put them in the scanner, however, it is possible that we will induce currents in this <coughs> conductor that will be conducted directly to the heart. This is especially a problem in patients after cardiac surgery where they have those epicardial pacer wires and after surgery I think they do just pull them out and sometimes they break off so they have these retained pacer wires that are basically there forever. So there is a question about the ability of these gradient magnetic fields, especially when they are at very high duty cycles, switching very rapidly, that they might induce a voltage or a current and cause arrhythmias. And that people who have these, that have heart pathology because of whatever scar tissue they have in their myocardium, might potentially be even more susceptible to the induction of arrhythmias. So in terms of a guideline, so in the, in the case where we don't even have a pulse generator at all, right, so our approach is we avoid imaging people that have these types of pacer leads using any kind of very high duty cycle imaging. So any kind of single shot imaging or echo planar imaging. Now in the presence of a pulse generator, just to finish off with this whole issue of why can't we just turn off the pacemaker and the patient will be okay. So the issue with, it seems that the biggest problem with pacemakers and MRI is that they mispace, that they malfunction and discharge at points during the cardiac cycle when they are not supposed to. So I was able to make that little drawing before, right? So, and in particular, that pacing at this point, right, starting an R wave during the repolarization phase, during the T wave, seems to be a very bad thing and something that is more likely than other events to induce a significant arrhythmia. So the problem with the pulse generator is even if you would, so to speak, power it off, if, if that's possible, is that we're still vulnerable to either directly driving the electrode or potentially driving the electronics of the pulse generator. So pacemakers are basically out as far as MR is concerned. So yes? Cardio pacer wires are contraindication so, to MR. Epicardial pacer wires are not a contraindication to MR in general. In patients with epicardial pacer wires, we do not, as I said, we don't do any high duty cycle imaging. So we don't do diffusion weighted imaging in those patients. We don't do single shot fast spin echo imaging. 
But to do basic, there, there's actually some data on this using basic spin echo, fast spin echo matter, types of imaging. Me in the middle of the night. Sure. Say, you know, the they want MR says we know these are there. Yep. If I say no high duty cycle sequences, can they eliminate those, or do I need to go? Specify well, the, 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 <laughs> the, the technologist, the technologist should know what they can and can't do. Okay. But I mean, for your information, basically, what it means is that if you're talking about the brain, it means no diffusion or perfusion weighted imaging. Okay. okay. If you're talking about the abdomen, it means no single shot fast spin echo imaging. It means no sort of ultra fast imaging. Okay. And the last thing about the gradients is that they are the biggest offender when it comes to acoustic noise in MR, which is, a, which is also actually a more significant hazard than people often recognize. So if you're either you know, working around the scanner or if you're, putting, if you're ever one of the people putting a patient in the scanner, you want to be sure that uh, you give them hearing protection. And one thing I think I may not have mentioned is that when we talk about conductive material and its interaction with the RF system to cause heating, I pointed out when we were talking about the skin staples or jewelry that if you have a looped conductor, that that is a much better setup for induction of current than if it's simply a straight conductor. So again, if you're ever involved in being in the room when a patient is pa being placed in the MR scanner. One of the really important safety measures that you have to be aware of and pay extreme attention to is that when we place our patient in the scanner, there are all kinds of devices, whether they are, you know, the receiver coil has cables that connect to the scanner, there might be all kinds of gating wires if you're doing a cardiac study, uh, monitoring leads, wh whatever might happen to be on the patient. All of those things are potential setups for burning the patient. And the way that we avoid that is by doing th taking three steps. First of all, making sure you never have a wire that is formed into a loop, that they're always straight. And you have to really be very meticulous about going through and making sure those wires are perfectly straight. Secondly, we try and keep them as close to the center of the bore and certainly not touching the sides of the bore as much as possible. Because again, the RF is a magnetic field that is inducing this, that is depositing this energy. The farther we are from the source of the magnetic field, the less the magnitude of the of the induced current will possibly be. And finally, you want to make sure that any of these things are always insulated from the patient. So there should always be sheets or blankets or sponges or something. You never want to have a wire laying right up against, against the patient's skin. And if you do, by the way, this is what happens. Right? This is not from Montefiore. Right? But this is a full thickness burn from the cable of a coil in the MR system. Right? But it should not have been laying across this person's arm. How long does it take for this to happen? Like well, this happened within the duration of the scan. The patient didn't notice? Uh, I don't know. This is, again, this case is not from here. I don't know the details. I can give you, you, sh you should be careful, though, about counting on the patient to notice. And I'll tell you a story about a patient with diabetes whose feet were being scanned because of osteomyelitis. <laughs> the patient was in the scanner with their foot in the appropriate coil. The technologist had done everything right. The scanner, the cables were all hooked up right. There was all kinds of padding around the patient's foot. Everything was done with great care and correctly in setting the patient up. And the technologist went ahead and did the scan. And the patient was fine. She was speaking with the patient. When she went to take the patient out of the room and opened the door, it was the smell of burning padding and flesh that tipped off the technologist that there was a problem. 
This was actually a problem with the guts of the hardware of the scanner. It was a major malfunction that should not have happened. It wasn't something that the technologist did. But this patient had this major burn on the side of their toe. And because of diabetes, right, they didn't even know it was happening.